As uh, you will have already heard in Daisy's introduction, when you actually try to go through the list of events and crises and even revolutionary upheavals that we've seen in society, both Europe and worldwide, over the last few years, it really starts to sink in that actually we have reached a critical turning point, really, in, in the history of capitalism and even the history of humanity. Um, those of you who are in Adam's talk this morning on uh, the economic crisis will have uh, heard him describe 2008 and the financial collapse as a turning point, an historical turning point. And I would completely agree with that. And I think that we can't really start with an analysis and a discussion on the European crisis without first considering briefly the global crisis, which of course sets the context through which these events um, are channeled. Um, just jumping back really about 30 years, the last period, the way that the capitalist system worldwide, but once again, particularly in Europe, emerged from the, the economic crisis of the 70s, was via a process of, I suppose the best way to put it, is a disciplining of the working class, that productive costs and labour costs were considered far too high, it was affecting the supply side of the economy, and so what you saw in countries all over the world, with first with the experimental and disastrous regime of uh, Pinochet in Chile, but later on in Britain under Thatcher, the USA under Reagan, you see a, a fearsome attack and smashing of the organised working class, a lowering down, a dampening of wages, if you like, great swathes of privatisations in the economy, and great profits being squeezed, really, out of the exploitation and super-exploitation of the working class. However, none of this was actually able to overcome the fundamental contradictions that exist within the society, not least among which being the crisis of the underlying problem of overproduction. Actually, um, despite the profits being eked out on the back of the working class, the lowering of wages and the consistently stagnant or even lowering wages in real terms were actually cutting heavily into effective demand. So not simply the wants and needs of the population, but their ability to pay for it. Concepts that I'm sure you'd be familiar with um, already. And if you've been to Adam's talk, then certainly now. Um, and the effect of this is actually the effect of man does not exist to be able to sell the goods that are able to be produced under the capitalist system. This expresses itself through overproduction. Actually, early this year, in January, the OECD produced a report on the steel industry in which it reported in the last few years, in the last um, three years, I think, excess capacity, which is essentially the, the, the word that bourgeois commentators use for overproduction, in the production of steel is now triple. Um, so the amount that is possible to produce in terms of steel is now triple the amount it's possible to sell. And even actually in a more stable period, about 10 years ago, the excess capacity represented about double of, uh, of the effective demand present. So this has been something that's been present in the economy for a long, long time. The solution that was put um, into effect in order to kind of overcome this barrier was a huge, an unbelievable extension of credit, both in the form of household credit, so the irresponsible and unregulated lending to households and companies by bank banks, but also the racking up of vast state debts in order to increase the social work wage and thereby give people a bit more disposable income to be able to then buy more commodities. Now, in the wake of the crash, one fascinating thing about this turning point in 2008 is actually many of the forces that you find in the economy which pushes it forward constantly, like credit, credit providing liquidity is a good thing in the capitalist system, have flipped into their opposite. All this uh, credit all this cash has turned into its opposite, the lead weight of debt. And no, clear, no more clearly can this be seen than in the Euro crisis and in the, European, the crisis of European capitalism as a, soul, as a whole. Now also the, the factor of globalisation, which you, you could argue was completed, a process that had been going on for about 100 years, but had been completed after the collapse of the Soviet Union and all of a sudden a huge uh, surface of the globe had been opened up for new markets and new exploitation. Capitalism seemed to have co conquered all of its problems. It seemed to have overcome the limitations of private property. It seemed to have overcome the limitations of the nation state. And you had these seemingly successful supranational, supranational bodies, such as the EU, pointing towards a new future of peace and prosperity. Now, the future, as we see it now, is, is much more bleak than that. And so I think that it's very important that we're having this discussion at this time into what's actually going on in Europe. But also in order to have that discussion and, and give it a proper grounding, we should also look at the class nature of the European Union, where it's come from, and of course where it's going, and what kind of position the Marxists should take on this. Now, just, in terms, just by way of a, an introduction really, I'm, I'm sure that many of you will already know much of this. What, what is the EU? It's made up of 28 member states. It described itself, <coughs> excuse me, 
as a family of democratic European countries committed to working together for peace and prosperity. Which is very nice. It's got, it estimates in 2012 it had a global population, a glo population of over 500 million inhabitants. Um, and its GDP con uh, constituted 23% of global nominal GDP, which actually made it the largest economy in the world. Um, if you look at it another way through purchasing power parity, it's only the second. But either way, it's a big deal. It matters for the world economy. Um, fundamentally, at its root, the EU is a free trade bloc uh, within Europe, of course. And that's characterised by what they call the four freedoms. The freedom of the free movement of goods, of capital, of services, and of course of people, which is becoming a bit of a political sticking point in many countries, especially this one. Um, you also have the Economic and Monetary Union in the form of the Eurozone countries and the um, removal or the attempted removal of um, border controls within participating states under what's called the Schengen Agreement, to which Britain is not actually a signatory. You have a certain amount of legislative cohesion under the Court of Justice of the European Union, um, a limited political union, so, uh, entities such as the European Parliament, and very limited military union. You do have a, uh, a common foreign and security policy, but really uh, Europe effectively acts as a kind of uh, an outpost for NATO more than anything else. Now, what is the history and development of the European Union? And I would say that if we look back at the, the sort of global historical context of where the, from which the European Union emerged, it's helpful to look at the history of the two world wars of the, the 20th century. Um, if we go back to the outbreak of the First World War over, just over 100 years ago, what we as Marxists would say, and I think this is, well, hopefully a fairly common assessment, although in the way, in the, after the centenary, the British government is seeming to take a different approach, but either way, the, 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 after the carving up of the world into great spheres of influence among the imperialist nations, eventually the contradictions implicit in this gave rise to the necessity, actually, the, of the historical necessity of a world conflict, the first ever world war on an industrial scale. Um, once again, that same process was repeated in the Second World War, which may well have been characterised by a fight against fascism, but also was once again an imperialist war for the division and redivision of the earth. Um, it was after this Second World War that the European Union came to being. And this is where one of the, uh, what I would call the creation myth of the European Union first emerges. I haven't actually encountered this viewpoint as much in Britain as in other European countries. France, for example, I've encountered this quite a lot. But there is quite a, a, a reasonably common feeling that the European Union, the task and the purpose of the European Union, the reason why it exists and the reason why it's such a good thing, is that it prevented a third world war. It prevented war between European nations. Um, personally, I think that's a mistaken view, but I think it warrants a certain amount of uh, further scrutiny. Um, one thing that always perplexes me about that viewpoint is why is it that it took place after the Second rather than the First World War. If it really was, I, I would say that I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the European population were completely tired and disgusted with the industrial slaughter of both world wars, but the desire for peace on the part of the population has never prevented ruling classes from going to war with each other. And I find it very hard to believe that the European imperialist nations suddenly developed an unquenchable thirst for peace, and actually the, the course of history following that would prove otherwise anyway. What happened? At, what was the position in Europe after the First World War? Like after the Second World War, you had the industrial slaughter of essentially a, work, a generation of working class people. Um, a crisis so acute it led to the overthrow of capitalism in Tsarist Russia, but also a, a revolution in Germany in November 18. Um, and you had a, a number of formerly powerful powers um, in a, a drained state as a result of the mass expenditure and destruction of the World War. Why was that not enough to bring about European cohesion? Now, the power, European powers may well have been drained after that, but you still had a position where the, the European allies, Britain and France in particular, were in a strong enough position after, you know, uh, after de the defeat of, of Germany and the revolution that they could actually impose their own terms. Um, un rather than actually pursuing the, the end to war in Europe, actually the, the French imperialists in particular, although it's not solely their fault, were pushing in the, the Treaty of Versailles to basically completely uh, decimate Germany as a country so that it would no longer be able to pose any kind of threat to their interests. Um, now, in the wake of the Second World War, we have to ask the question, were either of these powers in a position to do this? Britain, the old superpower, was, uh, who had been in decline basically since the First World War, was in no position to dictate terms to anyone. It had been completely shattered by the war. France, which um, up to the war had never really had that much of an industrial base anyway, for historical reasons that I, I won't go into, 
um, was barely a third-rate power by this point. Actually, Germany, of course, had been separated between the world powers and, wasn't, and of course, had lost the war. Really, the main players in this situation, this global situation, weren't European powers at all. It was the Soviet Union and the United States of America. And this is really the context, the imperial context within which the European Union was, was formed. Um, the European powers were facing, they found themselves wedged between two superpowers. They had communism on their doorstep, quite literally in the case of West Germany, and they were facing uh, potentially revolutionary upheavals at home. Now, their saviour didn't come from Europe, it came in the form of martial aid. Um, I was looking up some statistics on that, and, and it's quite impressive, the figures. And during the four years that the plan was operational, the United States donated $15 billion, and that's in you know, 1948 money. Today, that amount would be worth roughly $148 billion in economic and technical assistance to help the recovery of European powers and countries that join the Organization for European Economic Cooperation. Now, incidentally, that $15 billion, once again in 48 money, was constituted about 17% of their GDP. So it was a major investment, if you like, into propping up West European capitalism. And this was also on top of the $15 billion that they'd already given to Europe between the end of the war and the beginning of the plan. It was on this basis that the European powers were able to reconstruct their industries and actually it laid the basis for the, the post-war boom, which Adam has already discussed in his uh, um, lead-off. Um, now, actually, the unification of Europe was something that the United States' interests were quite, um, were, were quite keen on. And there were three reasons for this, really. The first was that Europe had already been divided between the, uh, the major powers. The USSR had taken up all of, uh, pretty much all of Eastern Europe, and uh, the United States already had um, hegemony, hegemony over the Western European powers. The second was that Germany itself was divided. It became known as an economic giant but a political dwarf, and that suited the interests of Western imperialism quite nicely. And then with the conflict between the US and the USSR still brewing and the, eventually the Cold War, having a powerful NATO base there and the continued presence of American troops, which lasted um, for decades after the end of the war, meant that it was very, very unlikely that these European countries would be pursuing a military um, imperialist policy completely independent of US interests. In other words, what I'm trying to argue is that European Union uh, unity and what eventually became the European Union didn't simply spring out of sudden solidarities between the Euro uh, rulers of European imperialist powers <laughs> that have been fighting against each other for hundreds if not thousands of years. It emerged out of the mutual frailty of the capitalist European powers. Far from being a European family, it was actually a huddling together, a clubbing together of imperial powers in order to then be able to exploit the rest of the world more effectively. Now, Getting on to the, the creation of the European Union itself, the founding treaty is called the Treaty of Paris, signed in 1951, and so it's, worth, it's worthwhile having a bit of a look at this. It, was, it set up what was called the European Coal and Steel Community, so it wasn't called the European Union. The, the purpose, or rather the stated purpose of that, was to bind together those crucial steel, coal um, and uh, industries, uh, not only because they are so economically important, but most important of all, they were fundamental at that time to the production of arms, tanks, and so on. Um, now, this bound France, West Germany, Italy, and the Benel what they were called the Benelux countries together on the basis of West German industry, which was now beginning to recover after the war. The, the declaration by the then French Foreign Minister, Robert Schuman, is very illustrative of kind of the intentions, at least in my opinion, of the founders of what became the European Union. Uh, it laid the basis for this treaty, it came out a, a year before. And in it he, he says, ostensibly, the purpose was to make, these are my words, not his, he says, the purpose was to make war between France and Germany, and I quote, materially impossible. So that kind of, what I would call a myth about making war between European states, was there in the very first paragraph of it. But later, if you look a bit further down, I'd recommend everybody goes and, and has a read of this, because it is an interesting historical document. But if you go further down, you have the following clause. With increased resources, Europe will be able to pursue the achievement of one of its essential tasks, namely the development of the African continent. Now, I don't think you need a degree in history to know what is meant by the development of the African continent when it's coming out of a European foreign minister. This shows the real imperialist nature of the European project from the very beginning. Now, of course, Schumann was the French foreign ministry, uh, minister, and French imperialism was to set about its historic task of developing the African continent three years later when it went to war in Algeria, a genocidal colonial war, which still to this day the French establishment won't even call a war, they call it the events in Algeria. It, it really puts pay to the idea that Europe has, the European ruling class 
has fundamentally changed and become, become peace-loving in the wake of the Second World War. Rather, they were no longer in a position to attack themselves. They were forced to bind themselves together so that they continue, could uh, continue to trample the, uh, the developing and weaker countries in the so-called third, third world. It's also worth pointing out that the Paris uh, Treaty wasn't the only important um, treaty signed in that post-war period. You also had the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. That laid the basis for such bodies as the IMF, World Trade Organization and the World Bank. Now some of these are, in fact all of these are now household names, especially when we get on to talking about the Greek crisis. Some of the role that they played shows them to be purely imperialist bodies. In fact the, 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 the new world order into which the coal and steel community was born was one of free trade, the free movement of capital and American credit in particular, with the USA as the guardian of all. And this is, this is really the period in, in which we, we have been living and actually is starting to enter into its, uh, its, a period of acute crisis. Now, moving on a bit, in 1957 you had the Treaties of Rome, which created the European Economic Community and the European Atomic Energy Community, in addition to the coal and steel community. Now, they, this became known as the European commu Communities. Now, it's interesting to note that during this period, 57, up until the early 70s, about 73, European capitalism was booming. You had huge growth, particularly industrial manufacturing growth. Um, in all of the main um, capitalist powers in uh, Europe, particularly France, which had gone from being a, actually a largely peasant country prior to the First World War, they preferred to have their industrial bases in places like um, Algeria and Indochina, had actually started industrializing metropolitan France. Um, and so you, you had an increased uh, economic power on the part of the individual uh, European nations. Um, and it, it produced an interesting contradiction. You had, on the one hand, Increase to cohesion in the form of any, if anybody's studied your, or studying European law here, you'll find that there's some quite uh, important precedents set by the European Court of Justice during that period where they start to push more and more for, for economic cohesion and, and free trade and the elimination of all forms of protectionism uh, in order to increase pr prosperity across the board. But at the same time, you have this sort of political, because they're no longer able to wrangle with, with each other in a protect protectionist fashion on an economic basis, you have this political wrangling, particularly between um, Charles de Gaulle leading France and Germany, but also Britain. It wasn't quite um, in the European communities at this point. Um, he actually vetoed the entry of Britain uh, a couple of times in 1963 and 1967 when the UK suddenly decided, oh, actually, yeah, we, we need to get on, in on this as well. Interesting, the UK had tried to set up its own rival to the, uh, to the European communities, where the European Free Trade Association, which was a complete unmitigated disaster. And when they applied, uh, they sort of learned their lesson and applied to join the, what would become the EU, de Gaulle said no. And the reason was quite interesting. Um, he said that the UK would be a Trojan horse for American interests. And I think he's spot on. In fact, the, the, the relationship, the special relationship, sorry, between Britain and America proves this categorically. However, in typical de Gaulle fashion, um, it's fairly hypocritical considering the fact that the very basis of the, the, the restoration of uh, French capitalism and the very basis of the European communities was American martial aid. So it seems to be six of one and half a dozen of the other from him. But eventually Britain did join, of course. And then in the 70s, all across Europe, you have a slowdown and a slump in the economy, the, the crisis of the 1970s, which eventually leads to the, the flipping round, if you like, from a Keynesian, a largely Keynesian-dominated pro financial programme to a neoliberal one, which, once again, Adam has covered in detail in his talk, and I, I won't go into detail on that. But it's, it's an interesting thing to note that, that this process did have an effect on the European Union and how it grew up, because it was in this period, in this period of slump, that you had the Single Market Act. In other words, the stated intention of the European powers to increase cohesion and actually be begin the process of, of finishing the job of European integration, if you like. And eventually this took form in the Maastricht Treaty of 1991. It's from this point that we have the name European Union. This is really when the European Union, as we know it, is born. Um, at the same time, the Maastricht Treaty expanded the, uh, the concept of the European Union into new areas. It included the common foreign security policy that I mentioned earlier, and it moved towards an EU coordinating policy on asylum, immigration, drugs and terrorism. In other words, it's starting to become a bit more like a supra-state rather than a trade bloc between individual nation states. Um, EU citizen, citizenship sorry, was brought into being for the very first time, and so this was to allow people from member countries to move completely freely between member states, and also to access uh, welfare and benefits in their uh, state of re residence, which once again is becoming politically a very sticky wicket. The treaty also included the social chapter, the famous social chapter on workers' rights, which the UK opted out of 
because we respect uh, social rights so much that we didn't feel the need to sign it down on a piece of paper, apparently. And crucially, the Maastricht Treaty, this is where, from an economic point of view, the Maastricht Treaty is extremely important for understanding the crisis that we're in right now. Because the Maastricht Treaty established a timetable for economic and monetary union, and it spe specified the economic and budgetary criteria, which would determine whether re countries were ready to join or not. Um, those criteria included, thank you, those criteria included a um, budget deficit of um, no more than 3%, and to have a debt-to-GDP ratio of no more than 60%. Now, it's worth pointing out that actually, at the time that the Maastricht Treaty was laid down, only one nation in the entire European Union met these criteria, and that was Luxembourg, which wouldn't really have been capable of forming a, a currency union all by itself. And so they started to relax the criteria. They started to say, rather than it being 60% debt-to-GDP, now it's got to be... Um, decreasing. In other words, you could have 80%, you could have 100%. As long as you were proving that it was going down and you were, you were doing your homework, then you were allowed in. And now, by um, 1999, they basically managed to, well, they thought at least, they managed to iron out the creases, they managed to fudge the differences, and they opened up the Eurozone and the Euro currency. Greece actually didn't qualify. Greece's situation even then was already so bad that they weren't allowed to join the Euro. But later on, they, they were seen to be eligible, and in the early uh, 2000s, they were brought into the club. Now, why is it that, despite the fact that, that you had this formal treaty setting out these quite strict criteria of budgetary responsibility, despite this, the Euro and the Eurozone were still formed? Now, I don't consider the German ruling class and the German capitalist class to be stupid. They would have been fully aware of the risk they were taking. In fact, it was a calculated gamble. And the reasons for this related to the interests of the German economy. Um, it's, it's one thing to be very strict on budgets, but the Eurozone opened up the possibility of a whole new market within the single market of Europe in which com competition by means of devaluating, uh, devaluing sorry, your currency was no longer possible. In other words, for the weaker um, producing countries, uh, such as Greece, German capital and German manufacturing could export even more easily to those co countries, basically with an open field. Competition, it, ironically, and this is a, a process that Marx describes actually, free competition eventually led to monopoly pretty much. And it was the monopoly of German capital. So it was a, a, a gamble which paid, for a while at least, paid off in a big, big way. I have some statistics here that show that the single market and the creation of the euro were very powerful tools in the concentration and centralisation of capital, from which German industry in particular has benefited enormously. Germany's balance of trade surplus actually started to rocket upwards after 1999, the, euro which, the year in which the euro was introduced, and then between 2006 and 2011, so you'll know that three of these are crisis years, um, the European Union as a whole saw its, saw its share of world trade shrink from 17.3 to 15.5%, but Germany's relative share grew. Um, in other words, as the minnows start to become um, more and more, uh, encounter a more and more difficult economic uh, situation, the, the bigger fish, if you like, start to actually swallow them up. In terms of the performance of industrial production from 2000 to 2011, Germany's increased by 19.7%, so almost 20%, and Greece's fell by 30%. Now, in between that, you also have Italy, which is the third largest economy in the Eurozone, at 17.3%. Now, this, the creation of the euro at the time was presented as a trump card, um, in the same way that the massive extension of credit and all the various measures that had led Gordon Brown to say that we'd put an end to boom and bust in about the year 2000. The euro was one of these things, not in the case of Britain, in the case of the Eurozone. Um, that having a European strong and credible currency backed by successful German capital. It would allow for low-cost credit, prevent the return of inflation, and, it, um, and so in so doing it would protect the weaker companies that have been really hit by inflation during the 1970s. Um, now of course we live in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, so what's happened since then? Basically all of the contradictions which were being masked by this, in particular by the Maastricht criteria, have suddenly come to the fore and have actually been exacerbated and amplified by these very criteria. There was a huge amount of misreporting, deliberate misreporting of statistics in order to keep within the criteria, or at least close. After, uh, in 2009, um, the then PASOK government in Greece was forced to upgrade its forecast for the de budget deficit from 6 to 8%, which is what it had given previously, which is still too much to 12.7%. In other words, they've basically just been hiding it in the back room, and all of a sudden they brought it out when the crisis hit. Britain wasn't any better. Britain revised its final forecast to four times higher than the original. In other words, this was something that was waiting in the wings for
for the, um, permanently, basically. Um, obviously, Adam has probably already described the process of the crisis, but what you had is, with the extension of credit, with the racking up of state debt, eventually, when the extent of the bad debts were known, and, and it's very hard to calculate, but the Wall Street Journal calculated the, the total of bad debts in Europe in 2013, I think, to be over a trillion dollars, uh, which is, actually happens to be double the amount in 2008, you were faced with an almost imminent banking collapse. Now, the way that this was solved, this huge... This huge <laughs> hole in the, I, I, is this my fault? I don't know. This huge hole in the balance sheets of European banks was filled by creating a huge hole in the balance sheets of European states, um, not least among which is Greece. And I'd like to concentrate a bit on Greece because it's, it has basically been the, the, the main arena of crisis in Europe at the moment. Greece has received three bailout packages uh, after it suffered its sovereign debt crisis from the Troika of the, e, the European Central Bank, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and the European Commission. Now, their, their bailouts amount to 252 billion euros. However, the LFC has done a report, which is very interesting. It says that only 10% of that has actually found its way into financing continued public deficit spending on the Greek government accounts. Now, that's, an, that's a complicated way of saying only 10% has gone in any way to the Greek people whatsoever. The remainder, well, according to uh, um, LSE, more than 80% of the so-called rescue package has actually gone straight back into the pockets of banks and lending institutions because they've had to refinance the older, more expensive bonds, paying higher rates of interest, pay that back, and then take out new bonds on a lower rate of interest in the hope that eventually the interest rate will continue going down and in about a thousand years Greece will be solvent. It's not going to happen. The, um, after round after round of uh, austerity measures, between 2010 and 2014, Greeks' public spending was cut by 30%, almost a third, which is difficult to imagine. But sometimes with these um, statistics, they're a little bit abstract, they're a bit ephemeral. But we can see in the news reports of what's going on in Greece what a public cut of a third of expenditure over such a short period can actually do to, to human beings. You know? Greek GDP has fallen by 22%. And unemployment now stands at 25%, with almost half of all young people uh, talking about 16 to 24. I, can, I still consider myself young, but I'm 26. I'm apparently outside of this bracket. Um, uh, half of people uh, in that age bracket are unemployed. This is an untenable, an unbearable situation. Meanwhile, the country's total debt amounts to 323 billion euros. In other words, more than the bailout package. It's been increasing consistently. This debt will never be repaid. I can say this with a certain amount of confidence. I do not believe that this debt will ever be repaid. The only force capable of bringing its reparation is another global upswing of capitalism comparable to the post-war boom. Where is that going to come from? I can't see any, uh, any source of that. Perhaps somebody can intervene from the floor and, and educate me, but I can't see that coming anywhere. This crisis isn't just restricted to Greece. In Spain, the youth employment figure is similarly high. We could see the political and social effects of that in the form of the Indignados movement and, of course, in the form of the rise of Podemos. In the Republic of Ireland, or rather, I should say, from the Republic of Ireland, you have an exodus of young people, young graduates in particular, co comparable to the scale of the Irish potato famine. It's the Irish job famine. They, they have no source of using the kind of qualifications they've got. There is a crisis in employment, and so... The Irish are continuing, really, the, the historical trend of exporting um, their people. Um, and that's one of the re re reasons and ways by which Ireland has been able to hold itself up or be held up as one of the poster children of austerity. The austerity program has been successful in Ireland because what they did was their unemployed all went off to other countries. And so basically the, the poverty was just being pushed out rather than pushed under. Greece doesn't have that kind of option. Now, even in this context, it's worth pointing out that the burden hasn't been completely fairly and equally spread uh, across the entire Union. Far from it. And it would seem that Germany had escaped the worst of the crisis. Germany is often held up as being, uh, continuing to be a healthy and successful economy. But Germany's turn will come. Germany, as an economy, as a successful manufacturing economy, depends uh, to a great extent on exports. Apparently, about 44% of its GDP is based on exports. Now, obviously, the point of an export, when you have an exporting economy, you need someone to import it. You need someone to buy it. Otherwise, you won't be able to continue exporting it. And so this actually gives us a bit of a, a, a background idea to why, is, why it is that the German ruling class in particular, which, of course, backs the European institutions, has been so hard, so intransigent when it comes to the demands of the Greek government in this past year. It's actually not simply an ideological question. I do believe that people like Yanis Varoufakis make a mistake when they talk about 
the European institutions, the likes of the ECB, being taken over by a horde of people with the wrong ideological idea, who were unwilling to give it up. There is a material basis for this. And actually, if Germany lets up for even a second, first of all, there's the question of contagion. Uh, you know, if Greece gets any kind of reasonable package, then Spain is probably going to be swiftly on, on its heels. And then there's the question of Italy as well, which I'll come to briefly. Um, they can't afford to let that happen. They simply can't afford to let that happen. In other words, this current survival of German capitalism um, is dependent on the beggar thy neighbour policy being pursued under the austerity um, agenda. Now, this is, um, it's also worth pointing out a couple of concurrent crises which have hit over the past few months. The Volkswagen scandal is very interesting because it damages a very important thing for the German exporting economy, which is the German brand, the German quality brand. If people become immediately suspicious about buying German cars, it is going to have a, a, an effect. Already the car industry is suffering, suffering great excess capacity. This isn't to mention the massive penalties, the, the, the fines essentially that are going to be levied on that company. Um, this can have a <coughs> profound effect on the, uh, the, the current surplus. The, the German state currently has actually a budgetary surplus, which you'd think was unheard of on this region, but it's very slender and it will be damaged by this. Then there's also the question of the refugee crisis. Now, I believe that that's probably a subject for a whole other talk, but it's something that we can cover in the discussion, where, uh, as a result, I would say, of the kind of imperialist intervention we've seen over the past hundred years in the region, you have this gigantic human crisis, this wave of refugees seeking refuge and asylum in Europe. And the political crisis that we're seeing revolving around this could potentially threaten to completely break up the European Union at some point. Because the, the division that is going on between the, the, the likes of Germany, the, the leading, the biggest European powers, and the more peripheral Eastern European states is something that won't easily be healed while you have this pressure coming in from outside. Germany has taken the lead in taking on um, migrants. It's taken on 200,000 so far, and it's planning on taking on another 800,000, but some estimates are saying that by 2016, so in only a year's time, you could have as many as 1.5 million, which apparently um, is the same size of the population of Munich. Now, this is in a capitalist system where governments don't simply um, set out mass housing projects to actually house these people. <coughs> Work is scarce already. Um, where, where are these people going to go? Already there are reports of local authorities repossessing people's homes in order to lodge migrants, which is only going to cause even more internal division and political chaos within that country. But also it's the economic effect. It is going to cost money. Um, the Financial Times predicts that the slender surplus held by the German state is going to be uh, removed. In other words, it will eventually move into a deficit over the next 12 months as a result of this migrant crisis, which restricts its room for manoeuvre. It's, it's had to constantly bankroll the Greek crisis what happens if you have another crisis elsewhere in the European Union? And I don't see this crisis going anywhere. And this is where I come to Italy. Italy, as I mentioned, is the third biggest economy in the Eurozone. It, its debts currently stand at over 2 trillion euros. The ECB and German capitalism will not be able to buy Italy out. And the position of Italian capitalism is not so much healthier than that of Spanish or Greek capitalism. If you have a world slump, which has been threatened by the, the, the uh, Chinese <coughs> stock market crash just passed, if this uh, perspective does come to fruition, then what you are looking at is a whole new wave, a whole new um, episode in the saga which is the European crisis, and one that which the ECB or any other international organisation will not be able to, to stem. It will get very interesting very quickly. And so, um, what, is the, what is the human effect? I'd like to just spend a little bit of time on this. It actually, it, I, I do feel sometimes that it looks as if civilization is rolling back on itself. It sometimes feels like the fall of Rome. And you can see the pessimism that exists, particularly within the, the ruling class, and the confer confusion. Just to demonstrate this briefly, um, about the, around the time of the election of the Syriza government, and then eventually the, uh, the, the wranglings over the eventually eight billion bailout deal, and the cuts, um, the eight billion cuts won, that won the bailout deal. Um, it was, I, I was interested to note that in Money Week, which apparently is Britain's best-selling financial magazine, other financial magazines are available, <laughs> they, the, that kind of the confusion but also the complacency on the part of some bourgeois commentators. Just show, I don't know if you can see at the back, but I'll try and show you the front covers. I won't quote from it. Um, this is 30th of January 2015, so Syriza government has been elected. Here, the front page shows uh, Angela Merkel perched on a stool trying to swat away a tiny Greek mouse who's sort of grinning and waving a Greek flag, saying, don't panic, the Greek vote is a great opportunity to buy Europe. I didn't follow their advice, thankfully. I don't have any money to invest, but if I had, I might have regretted it. Next, in less than a month, in two weeks' time, 13th of February, 
Could this man cause a market crash? Varoufakis there looking a bit sort of dangerous and sneaky, ripping apart a map of the Europe. Next, 20th of February, Greece goes all in. Crunch time for the Eurozone. And now you have a sweating Varoufakis pushing all his chips on the, in the uh, direction of Merkel. That kind of shows that they had to reevaluate their perspective very, very quickly, as did the European powers and, of course, as did the Greek government. And so that, um, meanwhile, what is actually happening in Greece? I've seen, I've seen some shocking statistics recently um, that showed that, if I can pull them out, Infant mortality in Greece between the years of 2008 and 2010 went up by 43%. Stillbirths were up 20%, 13 of which were underweight. And miscarriages um, have tripled in the period of 2008 to 2012, I think. So that's not even taking into account the last three years. This is the collapse. It, it, this could be portrayed as the collapse of human civilization altogether. This is at a time when the European family, which is bonded together for the sake of peace and prosperity, is quite literally devouring its own children. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves right here and now is, well, what do we say to this? It's all very well having a perspective and understanding of events, but what actually is the Marxist alternative to this chaos and this horror? And th I think I've got just enough time to try and do it, but I'll try and cover some of the alternatives and some of the options that have been put forward in society, but also on the left. So the first of all is the question um, of a social EU, in other words, reforming the European Union to represent the interests of working people and basically move away from austerity. This is the famous programme of the Syriza government, at least the last one. It's also the programme of Podemos, and it's one that deserves quite a bit of attention. Now, in 2014, before the election of the Syriza government, Alexis Tsipras ran for the president of the European Union. And he, um, I think it was the European Union or the European Parliament, excuse me. And he campaigned on the basis of a, an interesting programme, which I'd like to, to go through briefly. First of all, put an end to austerity. So, so far, so good. And a new deal for Europe to be financed by low interest lending on the part of the ECB. Suspension of the new European fiscal framework, which requires balanced budgets year on year, at least in periods of recession. The European Central Bank to be a lender of last resort, in other words, for the European Central Bank to lend even more money at uh, low interest credit. Surplus countries, this is very interesting, surplus countries should do as much as deficit countries to correct macroeconomic imbalances within Europe. In other words, they should export less and import more. But when they say they, they mean Germany specifically. Germany should export less and import more, presumably from Greece. I don't know what exactly Greece produces to export to Germany. Uh, but they must export something, and that's what they want to do to address the macroeconomic imbalance. And then a European debt conference, like that of 1953, which relieved Germany of the economic burden of its own past. Separation of commercial investment banking activities along, with the li along the lines of Roosevelt's 1933 Glass-Steagall Act, and then effective European legislation to tax offshore economic and entrepreneur entrepreneurial activities, with which I'm in complete agreement that one. Now, in some respects, this is a good programme. I'd certainly prefer it to the austerity programme being applied at the moment, but you may well have already noticed the several references to the 1930s and to the post-war boom period of the 50s. Basically, this is just a Keynesian, this is a classic Keynesian programme, copied and pasted out of the history books, with not actually any reference to the crisis that we're currently living through. It completely ignores two very important obstacles. The first one I've already mentioned, and that's the global crisis of overproduction. It's all very well calling for public and private investment into creating jobs, infrastructure, infrastructure, trying to develop the economy. But investment which leads to an increased productive capacity when effective demand simply isn't there will lead you nowhere, it will lead you in circles. At best, what they're suggesting is they want to pay workers to dig holes in the road and then fill them up again. That is not a solution to the European crisis. And then the other question is, where's the money going to come from? And this, this is the, the million dollar, well, the multi-trillion dollar question. Where is this money going to come from? Is it going to come from Germany? Absolutely not. Is it going to come from China, maybe? Can Europe ask China to write a blank cheque? Because, of course, China does depend on the European market. It is in China's interest to actually give Europe money. But I think China have got the Chinese bureaucracy in charge of the, the Chinese economy, um, such as they are in control of it, have got enough things on their plate, actually, to be trying to bankroll the European capitalism. I don't think Europe, the United States of America are in a position either. In other words, this, this programme could never have been applied Except for one thing, because there is, it's not as if all the money in the world has suddenly disappeared. There is actually the money that we could take hold of and use it to, to try and bankroll this programme, or even an even better one. And that's sat in the bank accounts of big international companies, such as Apple. That money is there, but we're never going to get hold of it by asking them nicely or trying to negotiate. And we, we learnt this 
And I think it also gives a striking lesson on the class nature of the European Union as an institution from the experience of the, the Cypress Varoufakis Syriza government in Greece. They came with their Thessaloniki program, a program which I would support, supported at the time, <coughs> with an idea of putting an end to austerity. And the way they were going to do it is they were going to reno renegotiate with the Troika. They were going to come and say, the Greek people have had enough, it's not working, the economy isn't growing at all, actually it's making the situation worse. We have worked out a detailed economic plan by which you can help us and also help you out of the crisis. They were going to be awful, they were awfully reasonable, and they put forward logical, within reason, um, arguments for for why they should do this. And Varoufakis, after he parachuted himself out of the government, actually did an interview where he talked about the kind of conversations he had with people like Wolfgang Schauble, um, where he was putting forward these ideas, and they're probably perfectly reasonable, certainly better than austerity, and the response was simply, no, they weren't having it. They weren't listening, they weren't interested. And the reason for that is because their minds have already been made up, and the, 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 their minds have been made up by the necessity of capitalism. It's part of the material situation facing European capitalism. Um, so I would say that this is more than just a woolly programme. This is sadly completely utopian. It actually shows the complete bankruptcy, I would say, of all kinds of ref uh, reformism, even with the best intentions, even left-wing reformism. If you assign your policy to the continuation of capitalism, but on perhaps a more reasonable or fairer basis, then in this current period of a cri acute crisis, then I'm sorry, but you will fail. And the experience of Greece shows this um, absolutely. Now, I also want to speak um, a little bit about imperialism, the nature of imperialism. Now, um, Lenin, in the, uh, during the First World War, if I can find a note, during the First World War, Lenin wrote a pamphlet called Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Now, in it, he defined imperialism as the complete domination of the big monopolies and financial houses over not only the economies of their home countries, but also effectively of the whole world, as institutions take control of the assets of foreign economies through the ownership of vast bulks of their resources, assets, shares, lending, debts, things like that, which supersedes the old colonial method. Now, it was this process that Lenin so accurately analysed that led to the First World War. But it's also, it's not of historical significance. It's something that's going on right now. The austerity process, the, basically the, the rulership over European nations by the European Central Bank, backed, of course, by the Bundesbank, basically by financial capital, is the most acute and clearest expression of, exper uh, of imperialism that you will be able to find. The European crisis is a crisis of imperialism. Let's not forget that before the Syriza government, before the, uh, the bailout terms were basically bullied into the Syriza, Syriza government, you had um, the Papandreou government simply deposed effectively by a coup and replaced by the Papademos technocratic government by the European Union. Did, who was Pat 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 Papademos? Who voted for him? Nobody. He was put in charge like a colonial government, governor. He was Europe's Pontius Pilate, if you like. And that's not really a kind of democratic heritage that we as Marxists should defend. Now, I'd also want to have a look, quick look at the other side of the coin. Um, I've spoken a lot about the European Union as an institution, as, a, as a, a, another form of class oppression, effectively, as an imperialist body, and one which I don't think Marxists can support. But does that mean that, therefore, we support the national capitalist economies of our own home nations? Does that mean that Marxists should, in this sense, say that it's more progressive to support the United Kingdom over the European Union? I don't think we can possibly say that. I think to pose the question is to show its absurdity, because it's all very well talking about the various crimes and lack of democracy in the European Union, and we could talk about that all day, but we'd need several days to talk about all the crimes and lack of democracy in the United Kingdom on a worldwide scale. So where does that leave us? Le leave us? Obviously, as Marxists, we do still, we can't just sit back and say, oh, we understand it all and it's all rubbish. We do have to get involved in the movement and connect with the mood at the time and pose, and this is the important thing for me, and pose a revolutionary socialist alternative. I hope that the point I'm in perhaps a bit of a long-winded way trying to get across is that actually there is no alternative to the European crisis um, under capitalism. There is no alternative to the European crisis within the European Union or without it. Actually, the only solution to the contradictions and crises that are racking the system at the moment is a socialist one. We, as Marxists, are internationalists. Of course, we're, we're not anti-European. The, the idea of combining the productive forces and knowledge of the European continent into a planned, rational and democratic economy based around meeting the needs of all rather than just the profits of the few is one of the most progressive things I can think of. It's something that I wholeheartedly support. The only way you can achieve that is not by a social EU, but by a socialist United States of Europe. That's the thing that we should be calling for. That's the kind of point we need to be making. Because if we don't, 
And if we limit ourselves to basically fitting into either of the capitalist camps uh, that will be put forward in this upcoming debate, that's already raging really throughout the, the European Union, then we've make, we'll be falling into the trap basically of leading people, leading workers down a blind alley. I believe that Mar as Marxists we have a duty to be honest to the workers and to pose that re revolutionary alternative. And so on that note I'll finish up. Thank you. Very good discussion, and um, I think some of the points uh, have been very good, and also given me the opportunity to clarify on some things that I maybe brushed over a little bit in my lead off. I mean, obviously, the, this very concrete question of what are we actually going to do in the event of a referendum in any of the member state countries, but obviously, we're here in Britain, and the British referendum is on the way, almost certainly on the way. Um, but before I, I answer that, I'd, I'd like to follow up on Steve's point, where he, he points out that we'd, we're given no real choice. And I think to go about answering the question of what is it that Marxists should actually, which camp, if you like, should we be associating ourselves with, if any, um, in order to begin answering that, we first have to pose the question, why is it that we have no real choice in this? Why is it that in this referendum, this upcoming referendum, which does have far-reaching consequences in, in, in society and is splitting along class lines, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back onto that in a second. Why is it we're being given an option between basically European imperialism, the grey-suited financiers of, uh, of uh, Frankfurt, or basically right-wing populism, Farage, Farage or Merkel? It's not a particularly attractive choice for anybody. So, and, and that leaves us, the Marxists, in, in, a, in a tricky position because really we shouldn't be associating ourselves with either of these, these figures or these ideas. And what is the reason for this? Why, are we, why have we found ourselves in this position? And actually, I discovered an article on, on the um, Financial Times, I think it was by uh, Wolfgang Munchau, that puts forward what I would say is an analysis that's quite close to the Marxist one. Actually, it tends to be the most intelligent analysts and the part of the bourgeoisie tends to speak a lot like Marxists, it's just they use different words, they don't associate themselves too closely. But the article was entitled The Perplexing Failure of Europe's Centre-Left. And in it, he talks about how we've got basically the biggest crisis of capitalism of all time, right-wing governments imposing austerity, everybody hates them, why is the centre-left doing so poorly throughout Europe? Using an uh, example of François Hollande in, in France and Syriza, of course, in, in, uh, in Greece. So why is the centre-left, by and large, not benefiting from the failures of their political opponents, he asks. And I quote, The deep reason lies in its absorption of the policies of the centre-right, going back almost three decades. The acceptance of free trade agreements, the deregulation of everything, and in the Eurozone, in brackets, the binding fisc fiscal rules and the most extreme version of central bank independence on earth. They are all but indistinguishable from their opponents. I couldn't put it better myself. The reason why we are faced with no alternative, and the working class is faced with no choice and no alternative whatsoever, is because of the historic failure of the leadership of the organisations of the world class, a world class, working class, full stop. Every, and every country on earth, not simply in Europe, but in every country on earth, the leaders of the trade unions, the leaders of the old social democratic parties, the leaders of the old Stalinist communist parties and even some of the, uh, you know, the, the Euro communist groups or various left groups have proven themselves to be totally unequipped for this uh, crisis. Um, and the reason for that is because they are bought in to the idea that capitalism cannot be um, overthrown. It must be worked within. And therefore that the role of the left is basically to put forward a fairer Keynesian alternative alternative to neoliberal policies. In a period of crisis like this, that's not just a bad idea, that's a dangerous idea. And it's, it's leading the workers down a blind alley. We have to uh, be independent of that. We have to put forward an independent class position. And then the question arises, we've, we've all heard in the discussion and in, in my introduction what I think the independent class position is, but then the question arises, how? But I'd say not just how, but where? Because obviously we, as, as Marxists, are individuals who live in society, and so the question of where we actually, the fora in which we actually put forward these arguments is extremely important. So first of all, on the question of how, um, I'll, I'll put it negatively in terms of how not to do it. And I would use the example of Lafazanis in Greece, who, after the capitulation of the Syriza government, the left wing of Syriza, a group of uh, left wing MPs and party figures, in, including people on the Central Committee, the leading body, um, split away on a left-wing basis, on an anti-austerity basis, disgusted with the betrayal of the Syriza government. And in this, they probably shared the feelings of many, many people in Greece, many workers in Greece. In the last round of elections, which Syriza won, again, they got less than 3%. They got fewer votes than the PASOK, 
The PASOK was the socialist party that, when in government, imposed austerity and has been smashed. It's been liquidated in elections, and they did better than the left platform. How on earth did that happen? One of the reasons for it is that Lafizanis, rather than putting forward a revolutionary alternative, we bear in mind that in Greece there is a revolutionary situation going on. Basically, the only concrete alternative to the crisis in Greece is the revolutionary taking of the commanding heights of the economy and banks into public control. This is no longer a, ta a question of, oh, you know, no, not one more minute on the day. This is revolution or nothing, basically, in Greece, essentially. And w rather than putting that, he puts back to the drachma. So you're, you're a worker in Greece who's facing the kind of discussion, uh, the conditions that I referenced earlier. You are, feel completely betrayed and confused by your government in the form of the Cyprus government. And the alternative being posed by the left wing of Syriza is back to the drachma. It's, it's completely unpalatable and it's utopian as well. And although the Oxy vote, the no vote, I won't even try and pronounce it, the no vote in the Greek referendum was a resounding rejection of austerity and of the memorandum, it wasn't necessarily a rejection of membership of the EU at the same time. Now, there was a huge amount of blackmail going on from the European establishment saying if you vote no, then you're going to get kicked out. Or this is essentially a referendum on the EU. And they were brave enough to still vote no in the face of that blackmail. But from what I have heard, I'm not Greek, but when I've spoken to uh, comrades of mine in Greece and people from Greece, there is a great deal of terror, basically, at the prospect of being booted out and having to go, go back to the drachma. Because on the subject of economic arguments for and against on a capitalist basis, an independent capitalist Greece on, on the basis of the drachma would be a catastrophic alternative. The thing is, what the Greek working class is starting to realise very rapidly is that maintenance of the European Union, of their membership in the Euro and the U European Union, will also be catastrophic because there is no exit to this. And we, the, when it comes to how we make this point, we have to make it like this. We have to concretely explain that actually the only alternative is a revolutionary um, socialist perspective. And then there's the question of where, where we get more into the tactical question of, well, who is it we want to be talking to? Because we're not talking directly to the masses. When we as Marxists intervene, when we're a, you know, a small international of a few thousand, we're not, talk, we're not hoping, we're not going to stand in elections up and down the country and tell people vote for us for a socialist United States of Europe. As much as I think that it's a great idea, I don't think we win the votes required to make that happen. And I know for a fact that there's not going to be an option, a tick box on the referendum ballot saying socialist United States of Europe. So our, our perspective of Marxist, Marxist is a little bit skewed, it's a little bit um, removed from the question as it's been put by the capitalist media. From our perspective, what we need to do is build that alternative, the alternative that has been destroyed and all but removed by the established leadership of the working class. We need to restore it and base it on the ideas of Marxism. And the way we do that is by orientating ourselves to the working class, which put in a general sense sounds nice and simple and easy, but obviously that is a very complicated tactical question. And on a subject like the membership of the EU, which is so confused and so complicated by class forces, it requires a great deal of sensitivity. Um, so on the subject of the confusion and the class forces at play on this, uh, on this subject, one of the reasons why the dominant, by, by you know, um, the, the vast majority of Labour MPs and dominant force within the Labour Party in this country is pro-European. It's not actually a reformist thing, it's a liberal thing and it's a capitalist thing. It's not a reflection of misguided reformists, it's a reflection of British big business knowing what side its bread's buttered. They understand that Britain's access to the European market and U the USA's access to the European market through Britain is what gives it its privileged position in the world market. Britain is not a strong economic power by anybody's standards. Its ruling class is in a state of senile de decay. As far as productive investment is concerned, it's one of the lowest ranking countries in the world. It's about sixth from bottom. This is a country that prides itself on being the workshop of the world. The only way that it can basically get by is one with having a big role in the world, as they like to talk about, is basically by having a parasitical financial role. And that financial role, regardless of how much you lower corporation tax and financial transaction tax and stuff like that, is going to be considerably less attractive if you don't have access to what is potentially the largest economic market in the world. That is the position of British business. Now, does that mean that we should be pro-European because we think the British capitalism is so decrepit that it won't be able to survive properly on its own? No, because we're not bourgeois and we don't want to be putting forward that perspective to the working class. What we want to be doing is building our forces is reaching those layers of the masses that are already approaching revolutionary conclusions. They're already starting to question the crisis, question society, and actually could be won to the revolutionary ideas of Marxism. So how do we do that? We have to gauge 
which way the class is looking. And um, recently, now this isn't definitive because we haven't even started the campaigning period for the referendum, but recently I saw a Financial Times article that actually talked about um, the kind of class divide, the socio-economic divide as it put it, between the two camps. You know, we talk about in, in terms of like right-wing demagogy and, uh, and, and left-wing liberal uh, human rights and stuff like that. It confuses the issue. Let's get down to the statistics. They said that 75% of university educated professionals under the age of 30 were in favour of staying in the European Union. And um, a majority, I'm struggling to remember now, but over half of people polled who came from the lower echelons of the social and economic ranking, about I think it was CD, um, were in favour of withdrawal. Now on that basis we can't simply look at that one statistic and say therefore the working class is looking at withdrawal, but it suggests something, doesn't it? Now the, the Financial Times made the argument that actually because pensioners and such like today were less likely to have gone to uni than people under the 30, age of 30 now, that actually it's that issue, that it's basically a loads of grouchy uh, OAPs who are determining the, uh, the, uh, you know, the pursuit of withdrawal from the uh, European Union. I will let you make your mind up about that one. I'm sceptical. I think actually there is a layer in society that has looked at the events in Greece in particular, but also is starting to see the democratic deficit to, um, that exists in the European Union and thinking, I think we'd be better off on our own, or that I can't, I can't see any kind of avenue through this that will give me some kind of positive alternative. Likewise, we've talked about the forces of the right on the, uh, on the on this question of withdrawal. We know about UKIP, we know about the Front National in France. These forces aren't going to go anywhere. They've been propped up, they've been created essentially out of this historic failure of the leadership of the working class. And we should be making that point as well. Uh, we shouldn't be timid about criticising the people that have put us in this mess. Um, and so, I, I mean, I would say personally that if the referendum were tomorrow, then I would probably, um, I wouldn't feel that I could abstain. To be honest, if you'd asked me last year, I might have said, oh, let's make a principled abstention based on what Adam was talking about, about the free trade protectionism, the, uh, the corn laws, basically saying, oh, either option is reactionary. But the problem is if you abstain, you are withdrawing yourself from the debate. You're basically taking a bit of a holier-than-thou attitude to the whole thing. So when people see the, this vote as an opportunity possibly to have an impact on their lives, and you say, don't worry about it, don't bother, then you're not really connecting with anything. So we are going to have to make some kind of a call, and for me, if the referendum were tomorrow, I would probably be voting to lead the European Union. But all, all the same, some of the points that have been made must be remembered that actually, this is a bit of a moot point. The European Union is in a state of collapse already. This refugee crisis, uh, 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 on the subject of collapse, this refugee crisis has been brewing and present for much longer than the last few months. It's been going on for years. And the European Union, it's almost all of its foreign policy, maybe not all of it, but certainly in North Africa and Western Asia, has been targeted towards keeping these people out. This problem hasn't just emerged over the recent period. They've spent billions of pounds, or, or euros rather, on... on being able to track people down, I know they recently got rid of the kind of the life-saving boats that were, that were in operation in the Mediterranean uh, ocean, uh, Sea, um, and also making deals with North African dictators like Gaddafi to keep them out. Before the revolution started in Libya, and before he was deposed, at which point the European leaders suddenly didn't like him so much, he was their boy. He was keeping these people out. He, they had detention camps in Libya designed to make sure that people who crossed the Sahara on the way to the Mediterranean couldn't make the last leg of the journey. In Morocco today, that process still continues. A friend of mine works in, um, I think it's connected to the, the UN, in a, an asylum um, refuge unit working with people in this situation. And a lot of their funding comes to the EU. Why? Because if they're put up somewhere in Morocco, they're not going to come to Europe. They're already making deals with Turkey. We talk about human rights in Europe. They're willing to waive all of their scruples over your, uh, human rights and fast track the process for Turkish integration into the EU or some kind of halfway house in order that Erdogan, who's moving in a dictatorial direction, um, by anyone's standards, can be used as a kind of frontier guard for the European Union, a Cerberus at the gates of the European Union. Once again, is this something that Marxists can be putting ourselves into? I, I personally don't think so. But as the po point has already been made, it depends on the way that the working class looks at it. This is a lesson that we've learned over the, the Scottish referendum, that really what matters is whether it's illusory or not, it's what people are looking at. We need to be there talking to them. And so the last point I want to make before I finish up is... Uh, following on from this, uh, the question of the refugee crisis, Emma, uh, uh, um, Emily made the interesting point that it's actually more than an economic problem, it's a political problem. Now, it, it's, it's not possible to say categorically 
whether all of these people are revolutionary, but they're certainly desperate, they're certainly hungry, and they've been brutalised by a civil war, and many of them will be uh, revolutionised by events. And that is something that the European powers will be worrying about. But it's not just in terms of the influx of, of people from these countries, it's the disintegration of the political bonds holding the Union together in the form of these, the new, so-called New Europe, the former Soviet states that were clasped to the bosom of German imperialism after the fall of the Soviet Union and used as consumer states, essentially, for, for German markets. All of a sudden, they're starting to rebel, and they're rebelling on quite a reactionary basis. You've got the Prime Minister of Hungary saying that this influx of migrants is threatening threatening the European Union's Christian fabric or something like that. That's the side of the European Union they don't usually want to show you. That's the kind that the liberal media will not want to show you. But it very much exists and it's coming into sharp contradiction and <coughs> conflict with the older powers who wanted to exploit these, these, uh, these nations. And that can develop into something very nasty, but also it has revolutionary implications. And this is what I want to end on. That what we're seeing, let, uh, I'll quote Lenin again, is, Adam was talking about, um, in, his, in his talk this morning, he mentioned that when a system is no longer able to develop the productive forces, it enters into periods of crises and revolutions. Now, we are in that period. I don't think there's really any argument over that, or there can be no argument over that. Um, events have shown it to be categorically the case. However, we can go a bit deeper into this question of what, what is a period of revolution. Lenin categorised, uh, drew out four elements, really, for a successful overturn. The first was deep splits and divisions within the ruling class. The ru European ruling class is a house divided. We can see this already. It's not going to get any better. Um, this leaves openings for all sorts of strange and revolutionary developments. The election of a series of government in itself is a complete, uh, it's one for the books. The, the, the rise of Podemos, seemingly out of nowhere. The election of the most left-wing Labour lead, Party leader in history after a catastrophic defeat in the election and the, the Euro Scottish referendum result. This shows that there is, first of all, there is a great deal of anger um, and a, a desire for change at the bottom and at the top, complete ineptitude and confusion. Just look at the picture of ineptitude that is David Cameron. He is an expression of his class. It's not that just he's an idiot. His class his, <laughs> has reached a historical impasse from which it cannot escape. It doesn't matter. You could have a, an MIT graduate, you could have a genius in charge of the country, they will not be able to do a better job because they have to do it within the capitalist system. So there's that element. The second element is that the middle class is wavering and actually poss possibly moving in a revolutionary direction. And we can see with the kind of the violent swervings to the left and the right within the European middle class that I wouldn't say that this process is complete, but it's going, it's ongoing, and it's there to be seen. Um, and actually, the, the growth of the populist right is a, is a bit of an expression of this. And the fact that you can have the growth of, uh, seeming growth of UKIP, I think they won 4 million votes in the last election. And yet, at the same time, when they're polled, a majority of um, people intending to vote UKIP said they were in favour of the renationalisation of the railways. That's never been Nigel Farage's programme. Uh, and so, already, when they've had cross-party polling, a great deal of UKIP voters who voted UKIP in the last election are looking to Jeremy Corbyn. Th they look like chalk and cheese, but actually it's people looking for an alternative, even a seemingly reactionary one. And that in itself has revolutionary implications. The third is that the, wor the working class is ready and prepared to sacrifice for the revolution and to, to overthrow and for, to achieve change. And that's been categorically proven. Perhaps not everywhere in Europe, but this process has started. It's been proven without a shadow of a doubt in Greece, and that no referendum result proves it beyond any reasonable doubt. The fourth one is that there is a revolutionary organisation capable of taking power and transforming society. That is completely absent. It exists nowhere. It basically exists, I would say, it exists in this room and in the other room, although this room's better. <laughs> and, and, and so this is actually why I want to end on this point, because it's all very well knowing that society is crumbling around us, that the ruling class cannot c retain control of the situation, and that the working class is prepared to move in a revolutionary direction. But without the requisite leadership and without the ideas of Marxism, on a, on a, a strong and influential scale, not an organisation of several hundred people, all that will ultimately be for nothing. And that's why I will use this opportunity to end on asking you to all seriously consider joining with us and getting involved with the IMT. Thank you.